It's August 15th, 1057, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Macbeth gets killed off stage in Shakespeare's play, so you don't know for sure he's dead until Macduff enters stage left holding his head on a spike, which pretty much <laughs> seals the deal. But eyewitnesses to the murder of the real Scottish king, Macbeth, were seemingly just as thin on the ground today in history in 1057, when at the Battle of Lumfannon in Aberdeenshire, King Macbeth did indeed expire, but we don't know for sure who done it or how. Yeah, what we've got is that his end came probably at the hands of one Malcolm McDuncan's men. They killed Macbeth as he tried to make it back to his home province of Moray uh, with his own contingent of bodyguards. His body was actually buried on the Holy Isle of Iona in a ceremony that was said to be worthy of a lawful king of Scotland, which is entirely contrary to what Shakespeare would have us believe about this guy. Basically, that he was a villain of some kind, when in actual fact, it seems that in history, at least, he was quite well regarded both at the time and to Scottish historians who followed. Yeah, I mean, the play makes Macbeth's reign seem quite sweaty and fraught, but it did last for 17 years in real life. You know, it can't all have been ghost daggers and phantom blood spots. (laughs) One contemporary record refers to Macbeth as the renowned, and it seems like he didn't become a paranoid despot until quite late in his reign. Yeah, so, uh, well, to separate the true and the false... True is that Macbeth did seize the throne of Scotland in 1040, but the full spear is that doesn't necessarily mean he was evil. Mm. Firstly, it's not that Macbeth and his wife murder the aged King Duncan, as in the play, when he comes to visit them in their castle as a plot. Actually, what happened is that Duncan was about 39 and was having a battle with Macbeth. So, I mean, if Macbeth hadn't killed him, then Duncan (laughs) would have killed him. Um, And Duncan wasn't a particularly, like well-loved, established king either. He'd fought his way there himself, and he was only royal down two generations of the maternal line, which at the time would have cast some doubt on whether he should have been king in the first place. Yeah, Macbeth, meanwhile, he was born Macbeth McFindlich, and his father controlled the province of Moray as the Moor Mayor, which was kind of like the local king to that region who was beneath the actual king of Scotland. Yeah, his family tree isn't very clear, but some sources list his mother as being Donalda, who was a daughter of Malcolm II, the king of Scotland. Duncan was also the son of one of Malcolm's daughters, Bethox, So if those accounts are true, that would actually make them cousins and likely around the same age as well. Yes, he wasn't just a wannabe. And he had some ancestral claim as well that went even further back. His forebears had supposedly been involved in getting the Vikings out of Orkney. So he's not just like some guy who's plotting. Like he had as legitimate a... So why am I getting so defensive over Macbeth? (laughs) (laughs) But he did have a a legitimate claim. And that appears to be underlined by the fact that, as you were suggesting, if you look at the record, there are essentially 17 rather uneventful years as monarch that are documented. Like, he becomes king, and then 17 years later, well, about 14 years later, there's a plot to overthrow him. And then three years into that, he dies in battle. Pretty common for a Scottish king. And incidentally, not just totally uneventful years. He ruled the kingdom during this time of great peace that he had managed to help build and prosperity. Yeah, no, uneventful in a good way yeah. for then, right? Yeah, and he and his wife, the true Lady Macbeth, who was called Gruoch, they were particularly generous to the church, especially to the monastery of Loch Leven in King Ross. So they had this sort of good uh, religious credentials as well. And he was credited with decreeing several good laws including enforcing the traditional Celtic oath whereby his officers swore to defend women and orphans anywhere in the kingdom. What a nice guy. (laughs) I feel like we're going to turn this around in a second. Yeah, I mean, Macbeth and Gruach had an interesting meet cute. (laughs) In uh, 1020, Macbeth's father, Finlay, died in sudden and mysterious circumstances, which could have had something to do with the fact that his nephews, Malcolm and Gilia, took over the throne one after the other. In 1032, Gilia, who was on the throne at this time, himself died a gruesome death, burned to death along with 50 of his men. That can be an accident. (laughs) And Macbeth immediately became the king after this. And then, I mean, if Macbeth orchestrated this killing, his next step, our revenge, served at its frostiest. He married Gilia's widow, 
Gruach, and adopted their son, Lulach, which I have to say, this is a classic. Macbeth, we don't know what side he's coming down on, because if Gilia had died at the hands of another rival, that was just a kind act towards a deceased cousin's family. Yeah, worth mentioning that this is Macbeth becoming the more mayor of Moray rather than the king of Scotland. So he's a king, sort of, but he's still a sort of underling king. And this was around the time that Duncan was becoming king of Scotland. His grandfather, Malcolm II, died and named him as his successor. And this is a lot more controversial than it sounds, because at the time, the Gaelic way of doing things was called tanistry, which meant that the successor, you know, the heir to the throne, was basically elected from among all the eligible male relatives of the current king. And it was specifically relatives on the patriarchal side rather than the maternal line. And because Duncan was actually the son of one of Malcolm's daughters he shouldn't really have been eligible at all basically what Malcolm was trying to do was to do like the English did and just to name his next male descendant as his successor this didn't go down very well with the lords who ordinarily would have been the people choosing the successor so although Macbeth is depicted as being this usurper to the throne upending the natural order it was actually Duncan who had done that by being put on the throne by his grandfather yeah and then Duncan wasn't a very good king of Scotland and he led this series of pig-headed and ill advised uh, military engagements that sort of scattered the Scottish forces in multiple directions. Eventually, Macbeth joined one of the people who was fighting back against Duncan. And it's at that point that Macbeth becomes king himself. Right. And then, like, all's plain sailing, basically, right? Until the 1054 rebellion launched by Malcolm III, the son of Duncan I. Are you keeping up on your Duncan and Malcolm bingo cards? (laughs) Who was backed by English forces led by Earl Syward of Northumbria, The battle at Dunsinan was the centrepiece of this particular skirmish. The death of 3,000 Scots and 1,500 English Mm. are reported. So, obviously, like quite a few people did want him out at this stage, but he clings on for three years until today in history when finally he dies somehow. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and Macbeth was succeeded by his stepson, Lulach. If I tell you his nickname was The Simple Minded, you can guess about how well that went. He only lasted three months before he was also killed by Malcolm. But Lulach does have the distinction of being the first king of Scotland to have his coronation ceremony recorded at the first mention of Schoon, the location of Scottish coronations ever since. That's nice. And it's interesting that after Malcolm died, he didn't get the same royal treatment that Macbeth got. So years later, when Malcolm's body was finally brought back, to Scotland for burial after he was killed. He was interred at Dunfernline, thus becoming the first Scottish king to be denied the internment on the previous Holy Isle for royal kings. So, you know, it does seem as though Macbeth had something that maybe Malcolm didn't. Yeah, and just a note on the absence of witches. You may be listening thinking, but where were the witches in the real story? There is zero witchcraft linked to this tale of Macbeth in any contemporary sources. Shakespeare's depiction of the witches seems to be blatant pandering to King James, who was obsessed with the supernatural and witches in particular. So a few years before Macbeth was first performed, there had been witch trials in North Berwick in Scotland. And the most dramatic confession to arise from this trial was that the accused witches under torture admitted responsibility for these tempests, which had almost sunk the boat that carried King James and his bride-to-be, Anne of Denmark, from Copenhagen to Scotland. Shakespeare actually has his witches reference their power to create sea storms in the opening lines of Act 1, Scene 3. This is the point where when King James was in the audience, he'd be like, yeah, I remember that bit. But weirdly, on the other side of the voyage, there were Copenhagen witch trials over the same incident. And this arose when the Danish Minister of Finance, Christopher Valkendorf, came under fire for supposedly skimping on the outfitting of the ship. This was being blamed for why it had so nearly sunk. And instead, he turned around and said, no, I'm pretty sure it was witches. 17 women were burnt to death for supposedly sending tiny devils up the keel of the ship. (laughs) Yeah, James I was such an avid scholar of the occult that in 1597, he actually published his own book called Demonology, which was the study of witchcraft and necromancy and demons and werewolves and so on, that then was cited by Shakespeare beer as a kind of yes your majesty here's a play full of the kinds yeah. of things that you'll be you interested like horror, in horror i can give you horror right and look <laughs> the central character's a king um, <laughs> but what it did mean is that we get this superstition that macbeth is somehow bad luck he says looking over his shoulder in case the glass is about to smash <laughs> um, and that apparently comes from <laughs> The rumour that supposedly a coven of witches objected to Shakespeare using real incantations in the play. So they put a curse on it. That's amazing. Um, 
And that's where the rumour comes from that, you know, if you utter the name Macbeth in a theatre, then the show currently on at that theatre will soon close. Yes. Um, but there is an actually much more pedestrian origin for that, which might simply be that actors, knowing about how these things worked in theatre companies, if they realised that a company was doing Macbeth, then they realised that that company was reaching for a blockbuster to get them through turbulent times. And financially, they were about to close anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even to this day, productions of Macbeth, all the lovies involved will use the term the Scottish play rather than ever saying Macbeth so that they don't fall foul of this particular curse. Or fall off the stage, as happened at the RSC right. in the 1950s. Or have a stage weight fall on them, as happened to Olivier at the Old Vic in 1937. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was uh, the Spider-Man musical of its day. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow. The White House actually has on its premises surface-to-air missile launches. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.